and obey All right. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to share this these with you. I you have one. Pass those two behind you. There you go. <clears throat> it's not a a big thing. I just wanted you to see this and know that uh, we spoke, we spoke about it last time. The uh, Roman church, of course, made some changes to sort of, I don't know what you'd say, cover up their, the, their use of uh, images that they use. And I know when you talk to them, they would not admit to worshiping the image or you know, the things that they have, but we do know that they uh, pray through or to their gods, and part of their logic is, well, if your mother asked you to do something, wouldn't you do it? You know, so if I ask him, he might not listen to me, but if his mother says, Charles needs some help, that he'll probably listen to her more than he would me. That's, at least that's the logic that I have been given, the argument that's been given to me. Um, what's the flaw, the fallacy of that? Yes, 
know uh, if, 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 the, if his mother, Mary, asked him to do something instead of me asking. That's why they pray to Mary. At least that's what I have been told. Uh, I'm, that's not from the Pope or not from, you know, but it's, it's what I have been told by Catholics, that uh, if your mother asked you to do something, you'd be more likely to do it than if I asked you to do it. It, they could, yeah. Okay. Uh, have you had it uh, explained to you differently? Okay. Uh, but what are what is every Christian? Yeah, and we're a child of God. We're His brother. Uh, he, um, we're, de we're we're designated as priest. So we're all His brother. Uh, he or He is our brother, I guess I should say, uh, and we are priest. So our our designation, to me at least, would be just as significant, if not more so, than what they try to give to Mary because, and, and I, yes, Mary was called blessed because of her role. But anyway, uh, and they would not say they worship Mary, but they do in, a, in, a, in one sense. All right. What question did we get to last time? All right. Israel received the Decalogue, or the Ten Commandments, through Moses. But how many laws did they actually have? Six hundred and thirteen or seventeen or nineteen. What, anybody remember? Well, somebody counted them. Yeah, yeah but um, remembering is also part of the problem. So, what are these 600 plus laws? Are they, how are they different from the Decalogue, or are they different from the Decalogue? They're man made. No, they're, they're given by God through the priest. Yeah. Yeah. What's 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 the first commandment? Okay, how do you do that? That's what the 600 in all tell you. You know, and uh, thou shalt not murder. Well, what does that mean? So that's in the 600 plus commands, those explanations. So we've got the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments, and then we have some help in understanding and applying how, the, how they're supposed to go. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, and you know, uh, in our own si t uh, situation with our own taxes, uh, the last I read, there's like over 70,000 pages uh, that the IRS tax code is. 
and I, it may even be higher than that by now, I don't know. But nevertheless, um, you want to do something in your business, you know, you want to deduct something, there are explanations and rules about how, how you can do that and what you can do. So the Decalogue is like the core, and then the 600 plus commands support that, fill it out, put meat on the bone, so to speak, so that you know how to honor God and, and keep him first. All right, anyone else? Yeah, yeah, right. Um, there's cut the grass, and then there's cut the grass the right way. And I, I love the thing I heard this years ago uh, about the, the, mili or the military, the Army way. There's three ways to do it, the right way, the wrong way, and the Army way. You know, so whatever you're told to do, it doesn't matter how stupid it is that you do it the way you're told to do. And you say, well, I never did it this way before. Well, that's the way you're going to do it now. So we follow the rules according to, at least the Israelites were to follow the rules that God had given them. <clears throat> All right. Um, what do you think would be the most difficult command for Israel? Oh. Okay. So he said, she said kind of thing. Uh, nobody was there but me and, and okay, all right. Mike. Yeah. Keep God first in your life. And that's, you know, faithfulness as we go through the history of Israel, we see, you know, what happened and um, keeping God first and foremost being faithful to him, serving him. Yeah, and, and let me go back to the illustration of the uh, internal tax code. Uh, when it started out, it was very small. And now it's, it's grown exponentially. And that's what the Jews did. And, you know, I, we've talked before about um, uh, what they could do on the Sabbath day that amounted to work or not work. And they could not pick up a stone that was larger than an egg. I guess that was a hen egg. Huh? I don't know. And you could pick up a child, but you couldn't pick up the child if the child was holding a stone. So, they're just the rules they made up. And that's what the Jewish people had done by the time Jesus came into the flesh. That's what the rabbis, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and you know, well, that's, that's what they had done. So those rules were man-made? Those rules were, yeah, yeah right. but not the 600. No, no, no. Not the 600, but the ones that they added to it. Like, uh, uh, the, the, the Bible says you're not going to work on the Sabbath, you keep it holy, don't do any work. Neither you nor your wife or your children or your servants or even your livestock that, you know, pulls the plow or pulls, you don't work, Nobody works on the Sabbath day. Well, what's work? Yeah. And uh, the Sabbath day's journey was developed. That's how far you could go. Couldn't walk beyond that distance. And then, you know what they did to get around it? The day before, they sent a servant out, and whatever the distance was, let's just say three-quarters of a mile. I don't remember, but they, uh, it, you can find it. And at that point, distance, put something, a sandwich, a cup of water, something. And so I can walk there, and then for that moment, that's my home. So I can take a sip of water and then walk another three-quarters of a mile where they put something else. My servant has put something else there yesterday, and I can do something else. So they make up, make up ridiculous rules. Then they, 
then they, it's like, I, got, I guess I got a little politics on my mind, it's like politics. They make up a rule and then they put a loophole in it where they can get around it. Maybe they don't tell us about it or maybe it's beyond our capabilities because we don't have enough money or whatever, but they have loopholes. And that's what they did. And that's, that's hard for them not to do that. That's right. Boy, that takes me back to elementary school. <laughs> uh, Well, that's, that's what they did. They, they, I don't know whether they wrote it down probably or just verbalized it. And we also know that they became divided between the Sadducees and the, and the Pharisees. That was a doctrinal thing. And I witnessed a few church splits in my lifetime. And invariably, they justify it by some doctrinal position. Doesn't matter what it is, but, you know, they'll come up and accuse the other side of not being scriptural for this reason. And so uh, what I'm trying to say is, is we, they justify themselves. We justify ourselves. That's humanity. That's what we do. We make ourselves sound reasonable. And uh, therefore, we've got to be right. But they struggle with all of them, actually. All right, what about verse uh, 25? Somebody read verse 25 for us. If you make an altar of stones for me, do not fill it with fresh stones, for you will defile it if you if you use a cool oven. Okay. Help me out. All right. And what else? It, it's, it's about you and God. It's not about you and the altar. And boy, my altar that I built is so much better than yours. You know, there's a crack in your foundation or there's a chip over here on that piece of alabaster. Yeah, you just didn't do as good a job as I did. And you don't, you don't have to say that. You just think it. And even today, have you seen what people have done regarding their church building? And, and I'm, I'm not pointing to other people. I'm pointing about us. You know, we, we just get all wrapped up in the, in the building. And it's not about the altar. It's about God. It's not about the house of worship. It's about the worship that goes on in the house. Yeah. Uh, you recall that during what we call the transfiguration, uh, Jesus, before his death, was praying, and what happened? Had some guests show up. Yeah, Moses and Elijah showed up. And you remember what uh, Peter said? Yeah. Now, it... it, it the word that's used there simply means shelter, like a lean-to. But King James translated it how? Tabernacle. And I've heard preachers from the pulpit accuse Peter of wanting to worship. Uh, and that, you know, No, he was wanting to respect, but what he really wanted was for them to be out of the, shelter, out of the weather so they'd be comfortable, so they'd stay. That's what he's wanting to do. 
But I get where I'm going with this is how the King James translation drove a lot of people to think of it in terms of a tabernacle and worship, and that's not what he's talking about. However, that is a problem. You know, our as he says here, the altar, the 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 altar that you build, don't dress it. Don't uh, build it with dressed stones. What's a dressed stone? Pink calico? No. Yeah, something they've chiseled out, made square. You know, looks looks good. All right. All right. Anyone else? Look at verse 26. Read that for us. Okay. Um, <laughs> underwear had been invented, apparently. Uh, yeah. And and where are the what kind of steps are these? I mean, is it is it just a couple of steps? No. Apparently, it's like a ladder, or it's like a high. High, high steps. Why would you do that? Yeah, to get closer to God. To again, going back to the special altar, it it it's about you more than it is about God. Uh, anybody else? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the, the two verses are connected together. Uh, 25 and 26 are connected together in, as far as showing off. And yet, on the other hand to it, there's some things you don't want to show off. You know, so th there is some modesty there. So, um, um, well, we'll start to talk about it today. But, you know, we, we see people who want to be seen for whatever reason. I see them. When you go out in public, you see these people that are dying to be seen, but they go to such an extreme that you know what they're going to be attracting or who they're going to be attracting. I'm trying to think of that. Uh, I just saw it recently on TV, the movie Coming to America, where the prince wants to find him a, a, a a girl who will love him for who he is and not because he's a rich prince. And so they're asking one of the local Americans, you know, they've just arrived, where do you, where do you find good girls? We've been to every bar in town. And the guy said, that's not where you find good girls. You need to go to church or you need, oh, you know, anyhow. But the, the point he's talking about here is two things. It's the spiritual and it's the lustful or the, the fleshly. What, what, what's it about? It needs to be about God. All right, let's look at uh, verse 21, or, or verse chapter 21, verse 11 through 12, and talk about slavery. One of the criticisms that some people will sometimes bring up is that the Bible condones, approves, encourages whatever slavery. Yeah, that's the big difference. How would you become a slave? Yeah. Most likely it was debt. Anybody else?
Now, there, there were other, you know, sometimes people think America invented slavery, but there's been slavery almost since there's been people. And there were other slaves at this time in history. And, of course, we know later on Israel's become, become slaves to Egypt. But what happens here in this chapter is God puts limits, restrictions, guidelines, we might say, on, on slavery. This is a fact of life. Um, and they had a couple of times where you remember the year of Jubilee? Remember what happened on that year? There were a couple of times when you just forgave all your debts. People owed you money, you forgave them. And you set your slaves free. But as has already been mentioned, there were some that said, you know, this is the best life I've ever had because I was out here scratching around trying to survive, and now here I've I got a place to sleep and I got food every day, and, you know, I've eat, huh, yeah, and even been able to get married, you know, so I like it. I want to stay. But we have a tendency to think of a slave as being someone who's beaten every day and never fed and you know yada, yada, yada. But apparently that wasn't how God wanted it to be. All right, next. Verse, uh, question six, talk about uh, the command not to murder. You read those verses, that's uh, 21, 12 through 14. He says, if a man schemes, what do we call that in our vernacular? That's first degree murder. Yeah. And so the distinctions are made here about, you know. Right. Because in, in life, sometimes things happen that you didn't intend. I'm not saying it happens every day or happens all the time, but when the occasion comes up, you have to has to be a determination. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Verse 13, however, if he does not do it intentionally, but God lets it happen. Oh, okay. Um, there are those that we use the term predestinationists, and they believe everything was planned out to happen. I don't think that's what this means here. In fact, I'm curious, does anybody have a different translation than the NIV, and how does it, how does it word this passage? Okay, still God delivered. Um, for me, I, I would understand it as a consequence of life. It, it's things happen. Things happen. It's a consequence of life. It's, it's like I didn't do it intentionally. Uh, I look, <laughs> I'll make it modern. I looked down at my cell phone or I looked over to adjust the air conditioner and all of a sudden this guy was in front of me and I hit him and killed him. I didn't intend. No, I wasn't trying to do that. But I just glanced out the window at some children playing in the park, thought they were cute, and all of a sudden somebody was in front of me. I did not do it intentionally. That's the way I would understand that, not that God put the man out there to die. How do we? Right. Yeah. 
we, we, we do things, things happen. I had a friend, um, I was in the ninth grade, so he had been in the tenth, and he was driving to drop his daughter, uh, his sister, and as he was a block from the junior high, a child ran out in front of him. You know, ran between the cars, and just boom, he hit him. And he wasn't trying to hit the kid. The kid just ran in front of him. Now, did God make that child run out there? No. But God did allow it to happen because we have free will, and we sometimes do stupid things. And there was a child probably learning to cross the street and didn't learn well, didn't follow what he knew. No, uh, he was carrying a teddy bear which flew over the, the car, and my friend thought that was his head, panicked him, <laughs> but the child was okay. They survived, I'll put it that way. Yeah. And this is where we, if, 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 for instance, somebody dropped a rock off a 10-story building and it suddenly fell right in front of me, missing me by a foot, I would say, oh, thank God. Thank you, Lord. I would thank God for saving my life, but that doesn't mean that he necessarily stopped me, although I do believe in providence. Uh, maybe a, a car squealed its brakes and I stopped to turn and look back and then the rock fell. I don't know. But um, it, it's, it's a challenge, I think, because we, we pray and ask God to help us and then we don't have help. So there's an old story about a man who was on a roof and he started sliding and he was going to fall to his death. And suddenly his clothing caught on a nail, a roofing nail that was sticking up. At which point he said, never mind, God, a nail caught me. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd rather say, thank you, God, for that nail. You know, I want to give God the credit for that nail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, again, if you're a believer in God, you will thank God for you missed a tragedy in your life. Uh, that car or that child or that whatever, just, you know, was, you'll thank God that, you know, the tragedy didn't happen. But you don't blame God for almost making it happen or letting it happen, yeah. I mean, if, you know, we use the term helicopter parent, that's for someone who's hovering over their parent, over their child, stopping them from doing everything that's going to hurt. God's not a helicopter God. He, and it, it would, we wouldn't like it if he was because we want our free will. We want our independence. And if he stopped us from doing something, we'd get, up, we'd get upset with him. Well, he, you know, he doesn't stop us. Thank you. Smother love, okay. All right. Um, look at verse, question seven. Any other verses down there that you want to apply to anything in the Decalogue? Any of the Ten Commandments? I want to talk about it. Explain it to us. And that's, for me, that's the key right there, not to exceed. This is a limitation more than it is a license. Uh, there are some people that if they, let's say, are accidentally, I didn't do it intentionally, I, I bumped into you and you fell down and broke your arm. 
well, you broke my arm, so I'm going to get a bat, and I'm going to break both your arms and your head. No, no, that's not what it says at all. It's you are limited in your punishment. Because our, our human nature is to make you pay for what you did to me. And that's the struggle we have in our court systems is what punishment matches their, their crime. And, you know, that's a challenge. Uh, somebody does something that uh, is a violation of the law. We have misdemeanors and felonies. Somebody does a felony, and you can actually find cases where two people have done the same felony in very similar circumstances, and one got five years and the other got 15. You know, we're saying, you know, what's going on here? So it's a challenge. It's a challenge. And what God is doing here is understanding the challenge we have and trying to keep us from going overboard in our vengeance. Anyone else? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I've used this as an illustration before. I think Walter Brennan was a character... He played a gunslinger with a couple of crazy sons. And in the movie, uh, he would take all sorts of abuse, and if you could slap him, he would slap him on the cheek, and he wouldn't do a thing. Because the Christian's supposed to turn the other cheek, and he was a Bible-quoting gunslinger. But if you hit him a second time, he just drew his gun and shot you. Because that's all he allowed. See? And that's the kind of extremes that I think God's dealing with here is, you don't go to those extremes. <laughs> what? No, that's not that movie. That's a, this is an old black and white. You're talking about James Garner. Yeah. Yeah, it's an old black and white movie. All right. Um, question nine. About worshiping God at a distance. Well, if I did, let's go back. What's the danger behind the warning and command in chapter 23, verse 32 and 33? Do not make a covenant with them or with their gods. Do not live, do not let them live in your land. They will cause you to sin against me. And who's he talking about here? Now, we have to understand that their kingdom was not was an earthly kingdom, but at the same time, it was supposed to be a worshiping God, religious kingdom. So what's he saying? Do not let these people live among you. Who are they? Yeah, but it's a specific group. Uh, Paul later says something about uh, evil companions. So what happens when you allow... Uh, idol worshipers and all that goes with that which includes fornication, human sacrifice yeah and you see what's happening e even in our world uh, and I know we are a, a unique nation but with the liberties that we have and the freedom of speech that we have and etc but we, we, ha we allow it but then what happens? After a while, we've allowed this evil practice. We begin to sort of, yeah, it, we kind of tolerate it, and then we kind of accept it, and then we kind of participate in it, and then all of a sudden, we're not any different than they are. And that's what he's saying here to them. You've got these people here who, they don't worship me and they're evil people. You let them live among you, what's going to happen to you and your people? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, right. It doesn't happen all at once. We, we'd recognize it and stop it if it happened all at once. But because it sneaks up on us. Same with them. Yeah. Drive them out. And in addition to that, let's, let me illustrate it this way. Let's say uh, somebody came and knocked on your door and said, we need a place to sleep. Our car broke down, and you said, okay. And they came in. The next morning, you hear noise, and you go look, and they're in the kitchen cooking breakfast. And then, then they're in, their, in the bathroom taking a shower and, and, and getting dressed and somebody comes out wearing some of your clothes, and then they don't leave. And then while they're there, maybe they make a phone call, and a half a dozen more people of their friends show up. And now here's a dozen people living in your house with you. How do you feel about that? Right. So if they allow the Philistines and the others to stay in that land, in addition to there being evil people who deserve the punishment they're going to get, they're going to want their land back. So God says don't let them live there. Yeah. Yeah. So when they captured the land, they had houses already built. They just were able to move in in, in the cities and et cetera. But nevertheless, they had to, they had to purge or, or clear the place out because those people will be a continuous problem to you. All right, good. Anyone else? All right. What about this idea about worshiping God at a distance? Uh, go ahead. And it harkens back to when Moses got the Decalogue, how God's up on the mountain, Moses up on the mountain. The people were not allowed to get on the mountain, not even their animals. And so God is so far above them that they worship him, but they worship him at a distance. Yes, they worship at the altars that, that they build, but God's not your buddy in the, in, in the sense that they would use it. Go ahead. So it's, it's not like uh, staying away from God. It's not like saying, well, you know, I wanted to go fishing today, so I went fishing, but I can still worship God out here. You know, a, I'm, a, I'm a long ways from the altar, the temple, the tabernacle, the church building, whatever. No, it's, it's not distancing yourself from worshiping, but rather it's 
understanding the, the elevation or the superiority or the awesomeness that God has over us and above us. He is an awesome and mighty God. That's what it's about. He's so powerful. All right, uh, verse 20, or chapter 24, verse 3. Why would Israel need to respond as they did that way? Somebody read that verse for us. Your response to their response? Yeah. United in their worship to God? Determined? Everything. And you're doing this because he is who he is. He is God. He, he's, not, he's not a little God, but he is the only God. And again, <clears throat> they've been in, in Egypt for 400 years or so. And we know that Egypt worshipped everything. We know the ten plagues were all directed against one of, Egypt, one of Egypt's gods. They had more than that. And so their, their concept of God, they've had no written word. All they've had is the stories they have been able to pass down for 400 years. Um, <laughs> Recently, one of my children told me a story and the event was real but the details were all wrong you know and, th and that's how it is we, we remember something but we remember it differently uh, and this could be I mean let, let's just say you tell a story about something that happened in, in back in your life and I don't mean when you were a child maybe it was just last year and you said this blue Ford and someone says, no, it was a white Chevrolet. Oh, oh yeah, that's right, it was. And that's what happened. And for 400 years, they've been talking about the promise made to Abraham. And that's basically all they've got. And they've seen all this idol worship. And now through Moses being on Mount Sinai, coming down and giving the information, they, they are mentally... Their mind is being, being expanded so fast, their, their comprehension is probably almost unbelievable that this God they have is more powerful than all the other things that everybody else is worshiping. So yes, we're going to do whatever God says. We'll do it. Yeah. You know, I, I think so, but... Uh, it's interesting to me and everybody else that's, that's read this is how quick they forgot, you know. Uh, well, I mean, you know, when the spies went into the promised land and came back, that wasn't that long. You know, it was just a few months since they had gone seen the plagues, a few months since they had crossed through the sea, a few months since they had been fed by the manna and the quail, and now the spies come back and they say, oh man, those guys are big. Oh, we can't go in there and fight them. Wait a minute. You just saw God defeat Pharaoh's army. Yeah. You would think that they'd just be, you know, it's fresh in their mind. Because we're not talking second generation. We're talking about people who just saw this within the last few months. And now they're too afraid to take the promised land. We haven't got to that yet, but nevertheless, uh, just in response to your question. Yeah, and sometimes we're, we're good at making promises and pledges like this. I'll do anything God says. 
and then a day later we're saying, well, mm, you know, we start crawfishing. All right, last question. Describe the language used to picture the scene with God or Yahweh. Not French and English. I was thinking in terms of mysterious, weird, awesome, uh, scary, what? Loud, yeah. Well, he may have not had to have been loud, you know, he may have use a different different microphone. Yeah. Or like, you know, you don't have to scream in here to be heard. Maybe maybe he made the first uh, microphone and speaker. But the language would be I guess I'm going back to uh, I I saw something in a in a play and we've got to have the same connections with people uh, as far as learning and understanding of what's going on. And all of the things that happened that are described here, the cloud, the lightning, and all, all that stuff, everything that went on, presents an awesomeness. I know that uh, probably most of you have been in some kind of thunderstorm. I don't know if anybody here has ever been in a tornado or something like that, uh, but if you're in a thunderstorm with a little lot, lot of lightning and a lot of noise, it makes an impression on you, and I think that's the point here, trying to, be, trying to impress these people with who and what God is. Yeah. All right, I appreciate your participation. Thanks a lot, and we will...